All right. So, should be recording and should be good to go. Wonderful. So, and that way, uh, if after you get done with this and, and you thought this was a great pr presentation and you want people to see it, uh, there's an opportunity for them to go to the city uh, page and get the video too. So, are we all live and good? We are live and good. Looks like we have about 21 people or so joining us right now on Zoom. And I think uh, the Facebook Live just went live. So, Sunny, is that still uh, populating, or do you think we're, we're good on that end? Yep, everybody is live on Facebook. So if you're on Facebook, there is a, about a 20-second delay. So we will be allowing for that delay when we do the uh, Menti questions. All right. All right. So, so my name is Eric Weir, and I'm the city manager for the city of Crescent City. It's my pleasure to uh, be here tonight with our recreation director, Holly Wint, and our human resource administrator, uh, Sunny Valero. Uh, we have been uh, working on this project for some time, and Holly will, uh, will sort of tell you all about those great details and why we're here and really what we're after tonight. First, I wanted to, uh, to show real quick, and I'll share my screen, as the city's website has changed. So as you are looking for meetings, so there's the new city website. Right? Fritz Ludeman did a, uh, did a great job uh, on it. But if you're looking for upcoming meetings, whether it be a planning commission, city council, there's just an upcoming meetings link uh, to the right of the page. Simply just click on whatever meeting you're looking for, and that will take you to the Zoom link or Menti link or survey link, which is included in, in this particular one uh, now. So that's, a, that's the new updated website and how you get to all of our meetings. So simply go there. Any upcoming meeting will be, uh, will be on your right-hand side. So wanted to share uh, that real quick, and now uh, now we'll turn it over to Holly and Sunny. Awesome. So already we already have a question in the chat, and uh, that is, are hands supposed to be raised right now? Nope. We can take those down. I was just making sure people could do could do that, knew how to raise your hand. So uh, with that, I'm just going to share my screen and uh, start this presentation real quick. And just want to make sure everyone can see this wonderful picture of Beachfront Park Ariel. Can everyone see that? Yep, wonderful. One thing I want to note is that there is a logo on the right hand side called Coastal Conservancy. That's really important because this Beachfront Park Master Plan was made possible by a grant we received from California Coastal Conservancy. And without their help, this, this project, these 35 acres and, and getting this to you wouldn't, wouldn't come at the level and quality that it is. So with that, um, let's move to the next screen. We just want to welcome you here. I want to go over the agenda real quick. We're going to talk about Zoom. We're going to, we've already talked about Facebook Live. We're going to show you how to do Mentimeter, which is the way to be interactive throughout this whole process. Some of you know, some of you it's going to be new. I hope you like it as much as we do. Uh, do a brief up, uh, a brief review on how we got to where we are today, where we're looking at costs and picking priority projects for um, a grant application that's due March 21st, March 12th. And then we're going to go through the master plan and individual um, groupings of them and costs. And then at the very end, we're going to allow you an opportunity to sit down with the numbers, sit down with the plan, talk with your family and do a survey and really have the time to tell us how you think we should prioritize this project. This has been a labor of love with this community. We're just so excited to do this with you. So with that, um, I'm going to go over to the next slide, which is going to talk you through how to do the Mentimeter. So first off, this is a live polling opportunity. Sometimes you can do them inside Zooms, but this is another fun way to do it. So if you, we don't want you to close the window or program that you're using to watch this presentation. If you have a phone or an, a lap, a, another screen, or a, a tablet, that's great. If you don't have one on hand and you have a child who has been doing distance learning, call them, have them come in here and help you. Um, so what you wanna do is you wanna open a new browser. Uh, and if you're doing it on your computer, make sure you can still hear me. Um, if you go to the city webpage and where the invite is, it's there. Or you can click 
uh, go to minty.com, M-E-N-T-I dot C-O-M, and type in the code 5214597. And if you already registered on the city webpage, on that same page, you could go to city.com, you can go to the meeting, and then you can just click on the link and it will take you right here. You should see this Mentimeter right here and the park, and that means that we're good to go. So with that, um, can I see uh, some hands if people are okay doing that? If you want to raise your hand and tell me you got that, you're good. Once we get a, some people coming on here, plus we have a lag for Facebook, right, Sunny? Mm -hmm. There's about a 20 second lag on Facebook. So um, yeah, you can always comment in the Facebook uh, chat there in the comments. I'm following your guys' comments on Facebook. So uh, please communicate in there if you're not on via Zoom. Awesome. So we're going along. We're, some people have already have it. They're logging in. It seems like we're doing pretty good with that. Um, so just keep that device by your side. We're going to come in and out of this presentation. We're going to be um, getting your input on, on that, on the Mentimeter. Okay. Someone's trying to find it. Um, if you want to go uh, to menti.com, I'll put it in here, menti.com. Uh, you can click on that and it might take you to it, but you don't want to leave the browser. So uh, do that. If we'll, we'll post the questions on here and we'll share them. So when that happens, uh, what we'll want you to do is if you can't do Menti, we'll say the question and you guys can comment in the chat box. Okay. And the easiest way to probably get to it all is just go to the city's website, right? Click on the meeting and then you'll see where right where you click to enter this Zoom, right underneath that there'll be a, a Menti uh, link as well. And you can just click right on that. And that's the easiest way. You don't have to enter a code. You don't have to do anything, right? That'll get you right in there. All right. So now that we have that and we've given enough time for Facebook, let's go on to the next slide here. All right. So first, I want to say that when uh, the city team started going out and doing all this outreach with the community, one of the wonderful things that happened was the engagement with the community and uh, the desire to acknowledge that this is the ancestral lands of the Talawa people. And part of that was there would be a group of people and someone would know. And a lot of people wouldn't know that this is the ancestral lands of the Talawa or anything about the history of those people. And so throughout this community design and then working with both Elk Valley Rancheria and Talawa Dene Nation, you know, when talking about Beachfront Park from, from now on, uh, this is going to be an important part of that conversation for, for those of us that have worked with it and those of us that have been on these amazing meetings and these calls. And so we just want to start with that as we move forward and thank them for their collaboration on this whole process. So just to take you where, where Beachfront was and where we're going with it. So this was back after, the, after people had moved here, settlers had moved here. That's Beachfront Park, that's French Street right there. And the stories go that when the storms would come and the tides would be high, like we had that amazing King Tide, it would roll right up into town and into you know, the bars, the saloons, the restaurants, the things there. And, and you could see that little barrier was, was good enough then, but then we had the tsunami. And after that, it was decided that we need to build up that protective area. And it was sand to begin with. And throughout time, we've developed it. The communities come together for Kids Town. The pool was built. Uh, we have the dog park. And we've been able to do some amazing community events throughout my lifetime here that are just um, etched in my memory as meaningful moments. But we're really excited about where we can go from here. And 2012, the city got some funding together and did a master plan. But at that time, there wasn't a lot of grant opportunities or funding sources to move forward with some of those projects. And then in 2018, the Parks and Water Bond Act, Proposition 68 came around and all of a sudden there was funding to improve state parks. 
What we're working with right now is round four of the statewide park program. It's $395.3 million is available. And we, as a city of Crescent City, are able to apply for up to $8.5 million to improve our park. The key component of this, of this Parks and Water Bond Act, this Proposition 68 is any funding needs to be extremely vetted through the community and it needs to demonstrate that any improvements or acquisitions are really based on what the community wants. So the city jumped in and has been taking this extremely seriously for, you know, since you can see here, September of 2019. We've gone to farmers markets, first Fridays. We've done multiple town hall meetings during the day, at night. We even went out, Sunny was part of this amazing group. We went out and we did focus groups with people that were identified that weren't able to come pre-COVID to a meeting. So we did focus groups actually at the senior center at Sunset High School. We did them with the Child Care Council and parents. We did them at the uh, Open Door Health Clinic with translators for the Hispanic Latino population. Uh, Sunny, can you think of another group you got to meet with that was wonderful? We met with a senior center, New Dawn. Um, those are a couple of other, uh, Sunset High School. What other ones were we part of? Takashi was a whole bunch. Um, oh, the soccer leagues. Um, yeah, so we met with a, a wide group of community members. And from that, we did interviews. We compiled all that data together with the help of our consultants to come together with the input and the design team we were able to hire with the Coastal Conservancy grant, PGA Design, came together, consolidated all that, that information, and we were able to hold, in the time of COVID, an extremely successful community meeting to talk about three alternative design focuses. And there was the culture focus, the recreation focus, and the nature focus. Um, that came out of all these intimate conversations and these larger group discussions on what the community wanted. So really talking to everybody and find out what they did happened over a year span of time, which was wonderful. And through that process, we did a survey at the end. We had over 300 surveys completed. And that's not just 300 individuals. There was, a, there was classrooms, there were family groups, um, there were whole uh, uh, multi-generational uh, family groups sitting together doing this survey together about what they wanted in the master plan. So it's a really exciting process that's getting us to here. And what came out of that is that really, they really, the community really said, you guys, all of you who participated in it, told us we really like the recreation focus, but we like some of the other components as well. It was too hard to decide. Some of the amenities that were voted on in that were enhanced play areas for tots and older kids, bike parks that were the three highest, but they're also adult and senior exercise, small courts, pickle bars. People were able to say what they liked out of those various amenities. And one of the biggest uh, uh, throughout this whole process, one of the biggest wants and asks of the community was an amphitheater. And the community was able in this to tell us what kind of amphitheater do you want? And we also heard which way do we want it facing? What, do we want it enclosed? Do we want it year round? Do we want it seasonal? And from all that input, we were able to go to PGA Design and tell them not only do we want these amenities, but the community wants events in the park. We still need sea crews. We still need 4th of July. We want to do, um, we want to see uh, demonstrations and cultural ceremonies from Talawa. We want to be able to celebrate family events. So we still want open spaces and, and we wanna look at nature. So we gave PGA a pretty tall order to come together and design our 35 acres lots of a big task to give them and this is what they presented to us and we presented this to the community and got feedback and to the planning commission who took a look at it and thought that looks amazing um, and we're really excited about that 
So with this, I want to just take a look and, and talk over a couple of things. You'll see the dog park that everybody loved and worked hard to get and enjoys all the time is still there. We're not taking away things. We're just adding to what's amazing already. And you'll see um, that Kids Town is still there, but it looks bigger. There's improvements on Kids Town. There's concerns that it needs a little bit of upkeep and, and some more amenities there. You're gonna see that the soccer fields are moved and there's different shapes and sizes. Well, not shapes, they're all rectangular, right? But different sizes because speaking with the soccer league, they need certain sizes for the different age groups. And so we put that in, in there. We also heard that people like pickleball, basketball. Um, we have here disc golf throughout the whole park. Disc golf is not going away. This is one of the best places. Wind, our, our inclement weather makes it exciting. There's some improvements over here down at the Marine Mammal Center. There's this interesting looking design in the middle in between these X's. That's a lookout center. And I'm briefly going over this for those of you who didn't participate in some of these presentations. All these major pathways throughout the park and making the T section, those are all ADA accessible pathways because our community really said, hey, I have grandparents who want to come and watch, you know, Frank play soccer, but they can't get down there. And so we really took that into consideration. Over here on this uh, left-hand side, that dirt area, that's a bike park. That's a bike park that's really exciting. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. As you come down Stamps Way, you see there's a little amphitheater over to the left and then a fanning design, which is a, is a waterfront plaza for more events in the community. So where we can have food trucks down there and when people come during the week to park and look at the coast, they can still go down there and walk over there and see some food trucks and vendors. We also have some cultural components and walking paths and really pulling in all of our monuments together to make it a beautiful place. So for some of you, this is your first time seeing it and you've just heard me say a bunch of words, um, but I wanna know what you think is just exciting just listening to this right now. So with that, we're gonna go to our Mentimeter and it should pop up right now. So on, you can go to menti.com and use the code 52145975. And I am going to go over here and share my other screen so we can look at the results as they come in. So if you wanna take a minute, you should be able to type in up to th three words to describe your favorite memory of Beachfront Park to begin with. So face, um, Facebook, you guys are gonna have a little bit of a lag. So anybody that's watching here and then watching on Facebook. So just showed up on Facebook. Okay. okay. So yeah, what's your favorite memories? When you're little, there's a lot of um, really cool things that I didn't realize happened in Beachfront Park. Um, I'm not from here. So those are some really uh, neat things that we heard when we were doing focus groups. Um, like teddy bear parade was one of them. Who knew about the teddy bear parade, right? Anybody like I didn't know sounds really fun, right? On some of the things too, with like 4th of July and the different events that they used to have. I mean, I remember as a kid, you know, just really embracing some of those events, like some of the logging stuff that they had and yeah, logging competitions and you know, the, the little BMX track that they had near the uh, near that west end of the park. Yeah. So some of you guys, you know, you have a lot of good memories about Beachfront Park that newbies like me don't necessarily, I well, I'm not a newbie anymore, but you know, um, didn't, didn't know even happened. And even some of the things that go on now, right? Like the, the yeah. why they have now, obviously Fortunately, is a big one. That's where you're seeing it become a big word is because a lot of people are saying that on this graphic, mm -hmm. uh, like pastels in the park and on Fort July. I mean, that's pretty iconic for our area and it's always a always a treat for us to walk around and see exactly what what the people have drawn out and whatnot and it's funny because the redwood stump is making its way onto our word cloud and the redwood stump was in our focus groups like every focus group everybody had the redwood stump the hollow, the hollow log. log yeah so all right it looks like we still have a couple things going in a wonderful memory walking just walking along the path huh 
that's just a beautiful scenic pathway that we have along the coast. It's gorgeous. All right. So we can keep entering into this. Um, we're gonna give people a few more minutes to, to enter into there and you guys can see how this is uh, filling in, bike riding, kids town, right? I was off at college when Kidstown was built. My parents and my brother were in the picture, but I, you know, that's one of those community events where you're like, ah, I wish I was there. That's such an iconic picture. Hostels in the park, that's another tradition. Kidstown construction's even on there. That's wonderful. Yeah, well, that was such a great project. It was all community, you know, there was, I think a donation of uh, the community partners that came together to make that whole thing possible. And then the community really just embraced it and came out and actually built that park. So that is a, that is one of those iconic projects that really does sort of define this community. So with this, I'm gonna change screens. This is gonna keep going. And I really want everyone to know after this, Sunny uh, will share some of these word images and some of these things to Facebook and we'll share them on the, on the city webpage if anyone's interested in seeing how, how everyone felt about these things and the, the feedback we got. I, I find it so, I love it. I find it so exciting to hear from you guys in this way. So with that, let's go ahead and start talking about how we're gonna move on in the next part of the presentation where we look at specific items and share with you um, some of the costs associated with those items. And here, I'm gonna pass it over to our city expert, Mr. Ward. Well, expert, and when you're talking about cost estimating, it's definitely a, uh, it's definitely a loose term and, and one that's hard to put your, uh, to really wrap your head around and to, to truly understand what those construction costs are because there's so many variables. You know, one, the construction doesn't happen tomorrow, right? So we're trying to project a couple of years out, trying to project, you know, inflation. And then there's all the other pieces that, that go along with it. It's hard enough on a, just a normal project where you have a defined scope. Now we're talking about Beachfront Park, which is approximately 35 acres uh, with multiple, multiple amenities. So there's, there's something like 38 different components that are listed out if you look at this park. And each of them has a construction cost component with that. So you have the construction piece, what goes along with that, design, permits, construction management, right? And then that's when you finally have your total cost for what it's actually going uh, to cost to build that particular amenity. That's great. When we ran through the numbers and we've had some help with our consultant and then we've, we've looked at the numbers internally, uh, made some adjustments. And this whole park, if you were to build it exactly like it is uh, shown for the most part, it's about a $22 million park. So that's, you know, that's a big, that's a big construction project. There's a reason it's called a master plan and not just a plan that you want to build for tomorrow. Right. So what we need now is we need to take this mass plan, which we have, and we have a lot of great community input, and now we need to prioritize it. And that's what this meeting is really about. We have some great opportunities coming up. This is not a plan that will just sit on the wall. Right? Even, our, even our past plan, which didn't have any money associated with it, right? we're picking off pieces. We built the dog park. We built the, the coastal stair piece. And so those things come to life. What we have in front of us right now is a huge opportunity to pick off multiple, multiple pieces of this. Eight and a half million dollars is on the table. All that work that Holly explained earlier with all the, the year long community outreach, we feel is gonna put us in a really good spot to actually get this money. Those applications are due March 12th. So this is what we're looking for input on now. It's gonna go back to the council on February 16th. They're gonna give final direction. We're gonna submit this plan and we're gonna see this thing become a reality. So that's, that's kind of the plan. But first, we have to understand the different costs of each of these components, and then we need your help and your input to try to put this park together with what we actually want to see with this first opportunity. So this is, this is an exciting part where we get to pick what we want, but the city's working really hard to be very clear with everybody about how much things cost, how much work goes into it, and how certain things need to be phased. I mean, look at Front Street, gorgeous, beautiful, and partway done, right? 
funding. We need to get some more funding for that. And you'll see as you go through these numbers, uh, things, anytime it, it's dealing with paving or construction, you're going to see that the numbers go up more than you would expect. I came into this job, recreation fund, had never built a park. And so I thought it was important, we as a team thought it was important to bring these numbers back to you guys so you could understand what we're working with and how we're going to layer this over time to build this great park. So, you know, Front, Front Street is a good one to just talk about briefly. So, like you say, great project. We got half of Front Street done. It's not all the way done, obviously. But that piece was a storm drain project is how we ended up getting grant money for it. And that was about $4 million to do half of it. So now, you know, our job as a city is we need to look for another grant opportunity or some way to fund that next piece. And we're, we're actively working on that. But that's kind of uh, an order of magnitude to give you an idea of just how much some of those construction components do cost. Awesome. So uh, I just had a request in the chat. Sunny, I don't know if you can help out with this, but can you put the link to the city webpage so that someone can pull up the master plan while we talk? That would be amazing. So everyone keep an eye over in the uh, question and answer. She'll put it there. Um, and you can also go to the new city web webpage. And if you click on the meeting on the our date, it will take you to the links of all that information. So just want to make sure that we answer that before I move on, because this is where it starts getting good. And, uh, you know, uh, you know, when you go shopping, you get a little sticker shock. You, you might experience that with me. So and the that's what website, just plug it one more time, crescentcity.org. And you can Crescent find City. all the links right there. All right, so now we're gonna go item by item through. Um, we have 30 items, so this might take a little bit. We're gonna go through and talk about each one briefly and the cost associated with it. So when at the end of this, you go to the survey to design the park and, and say how you would, what you would prioritize within that 8.5, you kind of understand where those numbers have coming from and where they're located. So to start with the dark parks improvements are 125,000, and that's to increase the vegetation around it, the fencing, but not the design. It's great getting better pathways to it and including it in the scope of the park. Also some shady areas, some plants there for that. Um, that's an important improvement over there, but you know, people felt really strongly about the dog park and actually they love the dog bone. So we got to keep that. There's not getting rid of that, right? So that's 125,000 to improve that. Moving along the top of the park here, we already have the north facing angled parking, but if we wanted to include some south facing angled parking, um, that, that for those three sections would be 1.1 million. Now, that is what the landscape architects and, and designers said. If you're increasing the recreation in the park, you want to consider that when you're designing a park. That is included and it would be included in some of these amenities. One of the other things that was brought to us, and people even emailed me pictures of this, was a senior bosk or workout exercise area. And where it's um, a little workout stations that are our weather stations that are easy for uh, our, our, our seniors to participate in. And the idea and ask was that that be up here closer to parking for accessibility for them. And that's why those are there. Coming down, we're gonna come to the bottom far right section. And this is an ADA ramp access to the beach. Uh, not that long ago, the city put in the staircase down there, which is beautiful and allows access down to the beach. But this is a, a ramp that would allow people with limited mobility access down to the beach. Along the, the, the Harbor Bay area, there's not a lot of access points to the beach. And once you get down there, it's kind of easy to navigate and flat. So creating that ramp access was something that people really thought would be amazing. That's $500,000. Then moving here, it's this crescent-shaped picnic area and kite flying lawn with paths and opportunities to sit and be underneath the trees and vegetation there, but still open enough to be able to picnic and see out and enjoy the harbor and be able to have community events in that space as well. So for that, that's irrigation, making sure it's right, bringing in top, some topsoil for the plants so that they grow um, and that the trees are healthier. 
that's about 950,000 for that large area. That's a pretty significant area. Um, so that's why that price is, is that. Then moving down over to the left to the North Coast Marine Mammals, Mammal, Mammal Center, for improvements, that's increasing pathways. We, we spoke with the North Coast Marine Mammal Center and they were excited. We were, we, we were nervous that they wouldn't want a lot of activity around them and they were excited to have pathways coming near and around them so kids and families could see the animals and learn about the animals in the area. Um, and then we created this turning loop here. So if we, if we needed to shut down how drive people could still leave an exit if we're having a large event down here by the plaza and the amphitheater so having this turnaround there uh, seemed like a great way to increase parking for the marine mammal center and down in this area where there's going to be increased activities but also giving people a way to exit out of there safely should we choose to shut down some of this space um, so that is about $210,000 for those improvements. So just real quick. Um, all right, there's just some questions about links um, and being able to access certain things. Um, Sunny, if you don't mind taking a look at that, that would be amazing. All right. And then from, from here, uh, through community conversation, one of the conversations was about vegetation and space and safety in the park, um, as well as some of the amenities. So I would love for us all to hop over to Menti again, if you guys are okay with that. I want to give an opportunity to hear from you and practice that real quick. So let's get to that. All right, so we're gonna go and go to the next one. And you should see now the new, hmm, okay, hold on with me for one second. I'm trying to, can you see that screen now? What features are you most excited about? We talked about a couple of features um, and we haven't dived into some of them in the details, but just off the top of your head, what features are you most looking forward to? The bike park, we haven't talked about it in depth yet. The amphitheater for performing arts and outdoor movies. The waterfront plaza for community gatherings. A lookout hill. Um, cultural walk with Talawa history. Uh, ADA and safety sensory play areas new soccer fields. I mean, there's some interesting things here. Pickleball courts. <clears throat> what are you most excited about? I'm, I'm excited to hear in this, in this, this setting. What about you, Mr. Weir? What do you think people are most excited about? Uh, you know, the, the thing that most people talk to me about when they, they talk about the Beach Run Park master plan is the, is the amphitheater, you know, and the, the ability to have concerts in the parks. Uh, you know, it's just a, it's an amenity we don't have right now. And what a great set, you know, if you've ever been to like the Brit and you, you know, you lay out on the lawn I mean, it's great there, but imagine on a nice day that we get sometimes you lay out on the lawn, you're watching, you know, a band, maybe the local band, whatever, and you you have the view of the Harbor. I mean, what a, what a, just a great amenity. Uh, so, yeah, so I, I think that would be a huge component. And then the other one that's kind of new, and hopefully we'll see some perspectives on this too, is that lookout hill. You know, that's a that's another one that uh, that I think really can kind of shape what this park looks and feels like from that that tourist standpoint, where you get up on the hill, you, again, you can overlook our area, see the lighthouse, see the, see the, uh, see the B Street Pier, all that. Can we put a little caveat? Like I said, we have over 30 different components in this park. I mean, it's 35 acres. Um, it says the ninth is not listed. We're encouraging you to add that to the chat. We don't want to limit your focus. If the, you heard something or you are in any of the discussions and you're excited, you can add that to the chat for us too. Um, we're excited to hear even about the little things, like the little amenities that some people are super excited about. You know, and the other one that will plug a little bit is that waterfront plaza. And I'm sure they're going into a little bit more detail, but to, to have that plaza area that will have vendor hookups and food trucks and really accentuate, 
you know, the place where we are and kind of captures the essence of what Crescent City is, you know, the, where the Redwoods meet the sea and again, overlooking that harbor, seeing the kiosk, tell the story, you know, the whole, the whole nine yards. And then there's certain things about the park that are kind of cool that came out of all of this. And, and that's the, um, there's a picnic area just where people, it's kind of like situated across from Seacroke and between the dog park and the soccer field. And to be able to like take a picnic basket and that's not an expensive amenity, but just to sit there and do that. Um, that's kind of fun too, right? Yeah, I mean, absolutely grab a blanket, right? Beachfront park, family, the dog, restaurants nearby. It's what it's all about. So it looks like, you know, one thing's been ringing true for the last year that I've been working on this year and a half. It's the amphitheater and performing arts. Look at that, just standing up right there as being a priority in our community. So uh, that's awesome. That's, that's amazing. Um, so here we're gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna go to one more thing because we're excited about certain things, but I wanna jump right to getting some feedback of some of the concerns that came up, right? Before we dive deeper into some of these things. And right here, I just wanna go ahead. Oh, people are still inputting. I'll come back to my next question. And we'll let people input. So Sonny, has there been some, some thoughts on chat too that have been uh, kind of going? Um, well, our chat here is going on Zoom. So as you guys can kind of see, and I'm trying to keep up Facebook chat. They like the outdoor movies. That sounds great. Um, someone is concerned and people wanted to make sure that we take the weather into play and in whatever we do, the weather we have at Crescent City. Um, question about, um, you know, very exciting for the vision, but what about homeless in the park, um, safety, trash, loitering, um, things like that, which I think we will be addressing later on um, in the safety portion of the presentation. Yeah. You know, that is a that is a huge component that you know we, we need to be cognizant of as well as maintenance too is another piece. Uh, another thing in the chat on the, the Zoom side of things is disc golf. Right? Disc golf is a very big amenity right on the water, attracts lots of people from all around, you know, the, the, the country, and I've even heard internationally, people come to play there. Uh, and so this is exciting to have that built into this new park as well as new holes and, and really uh, upgrade uh, that current amenity, which is such a, such a great amenity. Yeah, it's, we're, we're so lucky that all the recreation components that we have, um, Oh, hold on. I think I accidentally went out of Menti meter. Okay, sorry guys, I'm new at this Menti thing, so bear with me. Um, we have uh, uh, Heidi Keim chimed in and said that she's seen in some coastal communities a tidal horn, and so when the waves crash over the pipes, uh, the music is uh, music is created. So that's kind of a cool idea. That is awesome. So because the safety conversation came up and this is our community meeting, I just popped over into Minty um, a, a new poll, just real quick, since we're already on that conversation. Let's, let's see that. When it comes to safety, how would you spend a hundred safety dollars? What would you prioritize? Increased safety measures to amenities, which means requiring helmets, extra padding on certain amenities, and increasing the safe, safe access, ADA access. Uh, strategically planning vegetation to increase visibility throughout the park. That was a recommendation from uh, uh, our police chief and our fire chief. They both brought that up. Uh, increased maintenance and upkeep is how you'd spend your dollars. Lighting, uh, increased police presence, fencing around amenities, uh, decrease the amount of covered and hidden spaces or other. If you have other ideas about safety, go ahead and toss them in the chat. We're gonna be keeping all of these and making sure we capture all your thoughts. So <clears throat> when Sunny and I went and with some city team and some consultants, we went out and had our focus group. This was something that we, was a lot of discussions. And in my very first town hall meeting that I did, <clears throat> safety, K-12 
came up in that conversation as well. So throughout this whole process, in every stage of development, we've been listening to you guys and trying to incorporate these things. But right now, how would you spend your hundred dollars? And also, Holly, we do have our uh, chief of police, uh, uh, Chief Griffin, here with us tonight as well. And so, you know, the the safety aspect has come up several times. Chief, what are your thoughts on this overall plan and and ensuring the the public safety? Well, this started for us a while back as I took over. Uh, increased presence down there has occurred. Um, it's definitely been 180 degrees difference than even a year ago um, as far as congregating down there and the issues we had trash um, and things going on. So biggest thing for me is going to be able to, my officers can see through the park. Um, so there's no hiding, natural hiding spots that are created down there um, when we are responding. So just access through there. Um, I'm not sure any other specific questions you had on that, but we have been down there a lot more and it's definitely not as big of the issue that we had even a year ago or two years ago. Yeah, you know, that was the that was the big concern. I think that was brought up uh, even on our council meeting, I believe. Uh, council Member Smith brought it up. I know Council Member Enscore also uh, talked about it as well, but, you know, making sure that we don't get so many trees that it makes it hard for uh, just visibility, just in general. And and so kind of those those hiding places, so to speak. And so we've really tried to thin the trees out and make sure that the trees uh, that are there are limbed up uh, to, to allow that visibility. And then the uh, the other uh, question then is kind of, or at least I see on this uh, on this poll here, right? lighting a, is a big one that people want to see. Uh, increased maintenance and upkeep. Uh, Mr. Wiley, I say pop in uh, real quick there, sir. Do you want to uh, want to talk a little bit about your thoughts on maintenance on this? Well, I got to agree with uh, Chief Griffin there. Um, over the last year or two, definitely you can tell a difference with the safety side of things down there. That's been a huge impact with his leadership down there and the increased patrols um, with the less trees and being able to be visible. Um, you know, more of the trees, more trees, you got to more detail and weed eat around. So you know, the more open it is, that does help on things. And so those are all things we've got to factor in is as we add more amenities, you know, we were looking at the maintenance side of things. Are we going to be able to um, have more time with detailing or, you know, are we going to build it in a way where we can mow around it? And so those are been all brought up and thought about. I saw something there, Mr. Weir, that actually popped up in my brain too. Um, somebody's talking about more live cameras down there. I think if that's something that's accepted by the, you know, our citizens that could serve a dual purpose. Um, I know most large cities have live cameras just to show the beach off. And I mean, on a day like today, that would have been amazing to share that and attract more vis visitors here. If we could just show it down there, it'd serve the same thing. You know, if we could have, that would increase our presence just by being able to monitor that at any given time. If we know there's large crowds down there or not, or just to be able to pop on and see what's going on in the park. Not so much to individually look at what people are doing, but just kind of overall, and that allows us to direct you know our, our units to go to different places. Also, no, I think it can promote the park very greatly too. I think that's a, a good point. And so all the all the people that are uh, attendees on Zoom, we we don't have a question around that. So if you guys like that, give me just a quick raise of hand real quick. Let me see a, a flash of hands on the attendees. You guys like web the webcam piece of it. I would say that uh, I'd say, Chief, your uh, your idea is a pretty popular one uh, with the people here on Zoom. So I think that's something we can definitely uh, figure in the in the park. And then you know the other component that we haven't talked a lot about is like a PA system. We did talk about it on Front Street, and that can also serve dual purposes. You know, this this park is in a beautiful area. It's also in a tsunami zone, and so we can't forget that when we talk about signage, different things like that. They make a PA system now that you can actually, you know, you could get on remotely. It's all wireless and, you know, announce that, you know, there's been some sort of disaster and it's time to head north of 9th Street, you know, and just try to get those messages out as well as we could use it for events or different things like that. So that might be something that we bring back as well. Uh, there was a comment, I mean, a comment in the chat <clears throat> around various comments 
about safety and communication and signage. And that's gonna be very important. Uh, signage is gonna be critical around the park. The other thing that's gonna be critical is not only signage, but what's happening right now and in this moment to continue throughout the year. Um, you just saw Chief Griff say how much he cares and he's got his staff down there. And you saw Jason Wiley, who's in charge of public works. These guys are willing to come and help. If you see anything down there, if there's any garbage or anything unsafe, you know, call us, let us know so we can get right down there and deal with it. I had a couple conversations with people concerned about um, inappropriate garbage left around the park. And I said, well, did you call anyone? please call us right away so we can get that down there. And don't assume that someone else has called because in a lot of our conversations that's happened, people are assuming other people were calling or taking care of it or something was happening. And we don't wanna wait. We want, you, we wanna know right when you see anything down there because safety is important to us and letting us know is important and we'll get someone down there immediately. Who do you call? You can call City Hall and you can call the CCPD, right? If something's, down there and some something's unsafe. Yeah, Holly, I'll add to that too. We're dispatched through Delaware County Sheriff's Dispatch, so they can call the main dispatch, dispatch number if it's a non-emergency. And that'll actually help us log it better and it'll still get the same service. But I'll definitely echo your statement of people a lot of times think that we already know about it. We, there's You have to know about it because you're the police. We're not gonna know everything that's going on, and especially if we're focused on other areas of the city, um, different calls and everything. Um, we may we just won't know what's going on down there unless by the next time we drive through there and then it's 10, 15 minutes too late. So please call and we will prioritize the calls as they come in, but most often we can get units down there within a couple of minutes. So Chief, just for the record, what's that non-dispatch or non-emergency dispatch number? 707-464-4191. Uh, um, there's also a couple other ways I'd like to promote on the new website. There's a reporting form uh, on there under the police page. If you go to that, you can submit it. It goes directly to email. I get alert alert right away, um, and I can then create that into a call and send somebody out. And then if you see something that's been going on and on, and you just want to remain anonymous, we always have the WeTip line that you can use as well. So, so there's several ways. So go to the, uh, the police department link, right? Yeah, if you scroll down a little bit on the left side there, It'll say reporting form. Look there. Click on that and fill everything out. Um, required first name, last name, and then just tell us what the problem is. And you know, if you don't want to be contacted, let us know in there. That's very simple. I've gotten a few already, and that uh, and you can really use that for anything. It doesn't just have to be reported crime. I mean, if you want to put in a combination for an officer, you can use it to submit a complaint about an officer too. I'm going to be upgrading the website with those things specifically, but I just wanted to get it out there because a lot of people don't like calling in because they think they're bothering dispatch sometimes with, with, you know, minuscule things, but we need to know about them so we can prioritize for it. Uh, absolutely. We did have a couple, a PA for lost children or events starting might be nice. Um, someone's concerned about there not being restroom at the beach for a disabled access and um, someone on Facebook, um, emergency phone booths, like in public spaces, parking lots would be beneficial in the park area. That's a great idea. Those are great ideas. All right. So Ms. went back to, uh, back to you, but Chief, definitely appreciate all your input and appreciate your efforts down in this park area. It has made a huge difference with Measure S passing. We will be adding some more officers on as well. Uh, Chief's acquired a new, uh, a new, um, uh, side by side or an ATV. So when we have park events, you'll see a lot more of the police uh, presence down there just being just really active in the community and doing a great job of community policing, which I know has been a, a huge goal of yours. So anyway, appreciate everything you're doing. Real quick on that. I just saw another question about dispatch being overwhelmed. That, that, that is definitely true. They dispatch everybody in the county. So our office hours at the PD are Monday through Thursday um, from 7.30 till noon. And then my records cook takes a break from noon to one. And then she's back from one to 530. So during those hours, feel free to call our office. Um, and it's the same thing as calling dispatch. And, but we'll, we'll get an officer out that way. So, and just to tag on to the community aspect of this, pretty much everything I do is 
in retrospect for my kids, you know, and my kids love that park. They love going down there. So yeah, anything I can do to help out, make it a better place for my kids, a better place for everybody's kids. Awesome. All right. So that was a great conversation about safety. And we're so lucky we have these, these key people who are so important to safety in our community here to hear what you have to say. We can take that in and digest it. But now on to something a little bit more fun. I feel like we need to spice this up a bit. So one of the big things, the big pushes that I wasn't familiar about, but when I came on, it was pretty exciting to figure out was bike park. Huge community push for a bike park. I remembered, like Mr. Weir, the dirt bike track <laughs> that was down where the sewer treatment plant was. I didn't realize what they were talking about. And so for that reason, I'm gonna, <clears throat> excuse me, share my screen with you again. And we're going to, I'm gonna share a video. What I need right now is I need all of the panelists and all the participants to mute themselves except for me. Um, I tried this earlier and it worked, um, but it, you may not hear all the audio. Something about Zoom and videos works for some people, but not for everyone. So please keep that in mind. In the chat, if you can't hear it and you wanna hear it, we'll post the video, <clears throat> a link to the video later. But this demonstrates what a pump track is and why there's so many people in the community really excited about the possibility of having one. So let's, let's watch this. All right. So with that, it, I just want to say a couple of things. If, if you couldn't hear what some of the comments were, uh, the mayor was saying that there were writers there from three to grown men and adults. Um, and there were also that it's an all weather track. So that's in England. There's actually one up in Leavenworth, Washington, where it snows and has very inclement weather. Um, but because they're paved and where the way that they're shaped and designed, the actual upkeep and maintenance is minimal and they can be used in all weather. So this was a very interesting um, proposition when it came and then researching it, um, it was really exciting to see and to do some research on what Oops, on what that means. And so real quick, um, the North Coast Trail Alliance, which is a local group, worked together with Wild Rivers Foundation and actually found uh, a company that builds bike parks in this area to see about cost estimates and work together to design a pump track. And they did that process and then because uh, we found out of the larger grants and opportunities, they thought of what would make a bike park. So they went on from there and then 
added to the design a beginner pump track and a top area and then also for more advanced and and for different types of bike park what a slope style or dirt jump area would be like and there is um graphics and from a bike park design who's designed for weaverville and our area um our types of areas and this is their design so it's right here next to uh the the dog park and these are the paved intermediate and advanced pump track beginner pump track uh, a hot zone and then back here is more like the uh the dirt kind of dirt jumps and uh different wood ramps uh that is has a different cost and maintenance allotted to it um than the the paved pump tracks but when designing and thinking of what a complete bike park would be like this is uh some of the elements and and key um key amenities that would make this a bike park that people would travel from all over to and that would actually grow the skills because North Coast Trail Alliance currently has grants and funding and they're doing bike trails in Del Norte County on the Hurdy Gurdy Trail and various other trails for um, to allow people to go out into the wilderness and build skills and trail ride in in um, our parks and areas. So that tells you a little bit more about what a pump track is or a bike a bike park is. The intermediate advanced pump track, the example that we saw in the video, um, is a great amenity for young kids, middle school, high school, and active adults. That amenity itself is two million. And then the other areas, the beginner pump track and the teeny top area area is about 450,000 and then the slope style and dirt jump areas um, about 2.7 million. And it's, um, oops, sorry, oh. Holly, someone in the chat had wanted to know if that's going to be a muddy mess. Like the dirt paths. How is that going to? Yeah, so the upkeep for the slope style and dirt jumps much higher, a lot more work than the paved areas. Um, <clears throat> Uh, different, uh, I'm sorry, it's North Coast Trail Trail Alliance, Del Norte Trail Alliance. I called it North Coast Trail Alliance. Sorry, sorry Joe. Um, but yeah, the slope style and dirt jumps take more maintenance and shaping than the advanced tracks that once uh, the pump tracks, once they're put in, there's little upkeep on those. So, um, but that kind of uh, lays out what those amenities would look like. And uh, has i'm just looking at the chat real quick has anyone from the skate community shown interest in a skate park um yes there has been interest in the skate park uh some people have but then there was also the conversation that there's already a skate park in the community um that's run by the county so uh the push from the community was more towards a new bike park was the feel that we got from our meetings all right, so with that, um, keep putting your questions in there. We'll get to them uh, and we'll go on to the next one. There's a lot of amenities to get through. Um, so another key component that we brought into every step of this was ADA accessibility. I know I said that earlier, but it seems like the senior centers, the new dawn, um, the, the child care council was their moms with their strollers. Um, just increasing accessibility was said over and over for safety reasons. And so the, here you can see these big ADA pathways, pathways through the park that really create an opportunity for people to access the park from all four sides of it. That was an important component. So, um, and that kind of, also led to um, this picture is a great way to demonstrate this blue line around the perimeter of the park is a one mile loop. It's an exercise loop where there can be um, where there's spaces for exercises and kiosks so people can track how they're getting around and how much uh, distance they're doing around the park. So those were two things, ADA accessibility and an exercise, a safe exercise loop around the park um, that would could also be for walking, biking. It's just a nice path 
around the park. That was another thing. And from that, those design elements and talking with the community, our consultants added in the idea of this uh, lookout hill as being a uh, pulling all those places together to a point making the hill ADA accessible up to the top and then allowing some viewpoints. So I'm gonna first go to the next screen which shows the costs, the ADA pathways to the amenities access for all of our ages of, of, of uh, community members is 850,000. Like I said, pathways, concrete, stability, ADA accessibility, price tag seems a little bit more than you would think but that's how it needs to be done to be done well. And then so, the one mile ADA loop around is 400,000. And that's because we already have some of that loop already there. And so we can just add to that. And then look at Hill, I'll get to after this, is a great, um, a great opportunity. That's 900,000. Uh, Sunny, did you have something? Um, someone on Facebook had wondered why is the ADA ramp for access to the beach going to cost five hundred thousand dollars? So if you want, I can I can take that one. It's it's a hard area to build a ramp, and it's also a uh, you're traversing a, a large distance, so it's about maybe a ten or a twelve foot vertical drop from the from the top of Howe Drive down to about where the beach is. And so when you talk ADA access, you have to have a very, very slight uh, decline to get down. You can only go one inch per foot. And so when you're talking about, so let's just throw a number of 10 feet out there, that's 120 feet of ramp that you're going to need to build. You're going to need to build it somewhat wide so everybody can have access down as well as maintenance crews can get down there. And it's built on sand beach. You're going to need uh, rock slope protection to stabilize it all. Uh, we have some experience in this by just building that new staircase. And so you need retaining walls, rock slope protection, and tie it all back. So there's there's increased costs there, as well as just the permitting for that particular amenity is uh, is substantial uh, building on the beach. So, so those are the different components that go into that cost. Uh, the other one that you mentioned, Holly, was the ADA pass. This is just a really large park. So when you talk about, you know, 10 foot wide pathways that traverse the park, you know, right down the center and then cut across the other piece of it, that's about 25,000 square feet of pathway that, uh, that we're looking to build. And so that's where some of those com components get pretty expensive. Also, is the ramp at the lighthouse ADA? The ramp at the, yes, the, from the lighthouse battery, uh, the, the parking lot there down to actually Battery Point Lighthouse. Yes, that was built to ADA standards when it was when it was built, and I believe it's still compliant. And so that one's fairly long too, but that one has a bunch of switchbacks in it to uh, to get the length that they needed. And you'll see from this perspective, from the lookout hill, there's that switchback so that it's ADA compliant ramp so that people can get up and down it. And you can also see the length of those pathways um, cutting through the park, the straight pathways for the easiest convenience for people to get to things. The meandering paths are great, but sometimes for ADA accessibility, those straight paths are really, really helpful. They're also good for emergency reasons. Uh, you know, Chief Griff has his uh, new, um, what's it called again? This side by side, it's basically, it's, a, it's an ATV where you can see multiple people. I think it actually sits four people and has a little bed on it to be able to respond to emergencies. So these paths will be able to really be accessible in case of emergency to um, help get to uh, major amenities and, and support people down those major pathways. Um, the trees uh, at the lookout seem to be blocking the view. Um, actually, the way that it's set up, this picture makes it look that way, but the um, suggested plantings wouldn't block the view. And actually, the planting design is so that we have good views out to the lighthouse, out to the pier, and also out to the bay and looking back into the city. So yes, there will be some plantings that will block some of the view, but there's also going to be clear vistas that we wanna make sure that people see. Um, because as you can see, there's information kiosks and, and um, opportunities there to tell the story of this place. 
and offer information to people visiting and also to our community members who live here that would like to learn more about it. All right, we're, we'll get to the amphitheater. We're, we're getting there. We'll get there. S soccer fields. Soccer is a huge thing, came up in a lot of discussions. Um, we have the, the soccer fields in the plan. And when talking to the community, it came up that they needed repair, that they're important, that they're vital uh, to the health and wellness of the community. And these soccer fields, with all that input, have mental screening in irrigation to prevent gophers and maintain a flat playing surface. So these um, five fields and the irrigation for this area um, is $1.1 million. And then the 15, which is the new basketball, tennis, and pickleball courts are $350,000. So that gives you some idea that uh, a little more information as to why those soccer field totals are a little bit higher if we want that level of playing with the metal and the, uh, the metal to prevent gophers, the irrigation and that flat playing surface, that level would be this, has this price tag attached to it. So that's definitely something that you need to know about when you see that number, helps you make your choices. And here we are to the amphitheater. Um, this is took a lot of uh, community input. Every discussion had various ideas about the amphitheater. Um, it includes removable awnings so that during inclement weather, we can take it down and that it's not up in the winter. Um, it has a tiered grassy seating um, that will design so it's easier for upkeep and Everything about it has ADA accessibilities. Part of this cost is you can see this back area here. It's, um, I forgot the word of what it's called, Mr. Weir. The material they'd like to use on these is decomposed granite. And then so it's, it's not your typical, you know, rock aggregate base. It's actually a pretty stable material that a lot of people like to use in, in areas like this. And so that's for that back area along the main pathway so that uh, vendors and food trucks would be back there. And there's also funding there to put outlets so that we can have events there and be able to support a very uh, inclusive experience, a well-rounded experience, and allow people to sit for a long concert, a steel drum concert from our high schoolers. I mean, we've all, if we're parents, we've sat through some of those events where all the kids play, they can go on for a while. And this would be a wonderful place to sit and see uh, those events. Also, you can see that in some of these areas, the, the awnings are there, but you can also fasten a movie screen there so we can do movies in the park. So this could be performances, movies in the park, um, uh, and also when we took this to the tribal uh, governments, they were very excited about this opportunity, being able to come down here and do presentation and community events with dances and ceremonies and sharing their culture with the community and visitors to our area. And that was a wonderful thing to hear back from them when we presented this plan. So, Holly, just real quick while we're on the amphitheater, why don't you share the story of the, uh, the child in Crescent that you just met with the other day? Yeah, so uh, I was really excited uh, yesterday and today I was able to go into some sixth grade classrooms and uh, showed them I, I did a worksheet for them and, and did a simplified version of this presentation and I said an amphitheater and this one kid goes what's an amphitheater and um, uh, we explained it's a place where you can get on stage and we showed this picture you can get on stage and you can sing. I asked if anybody was in band or, or did any plays or was excited about this and this young man goes wait. Anybody can go up there and do that. I was like, yeah, this is a community park. It would be there all the time. He's like, it's not blocked off or anything. I said, no, once this is up, you could go up there and anyone could stand up there and, and do whatever he's like are you kidding me? I could go. I said, you could have your family sing out. You could sing. He's like, I have to have this for my birthday. I have. That's what I want to do for my birthday. It was the cutest thing I'd ever seen. He was so excited. Um, so when he prioritized, I allowed the um, kids to prioritize what they thought the community should have. And then they did their own wish list. Well, he made sure the amphitheater was on 
but the community should have, and then his personal wish list with like a big circle. So um, I, I think that this, this will be a great opportunity for, uh, for kids and, and they were excited about it. A couple of um, things in the chat is how many people can be seated for events? And will there be electrical and how will their instruments be protected from drizzle? So the awnings are, are there. Um, how will they be protected from drizzle? Uh, you know, that would be something, I mean, we have inclement weather. They might not be completely protected from, from, uh, from drizzle. Uh, I mean, well, drizzle's just light. The awnings would protect, but sometimes we have, you know, interesting rain, but they wouldn't protect them from that, but the drizzle, it wouldn't. And I believe that um, when we were talking about capacity with this, um, actually right off the top of my head, I can't remember the actual number of capacity, but I will make sure to get that out to you guys. Mr. Weir, do you remember what capacity we finally settled on? It wasn't around a thousand, a thousand sticks in, in my head, somewhere in there, a thousand, twelve hundred, something like that. Yeah, it was the same. I, I talked, I can't remember exactly right now. I'll, I'll look through my emails. I spoke with um, the fairgrounds and I asked them when they have their big events for the fair, what's the, the largest capacity for one of their um, concerts that they had and made sure we would be able to have that capacity. And then also was <clears throat> under what the Brit had. We don't we wouldn't have the same capacity as the Brit in Jacksonville, but definitely the capacity to do at least what happens at the fairgrounds for one of their big concerts for, for uh, the fair. And someone was wondering on Facebook about acoustics, the view is important, but competing noise and sound projection are a consideration. So how is that figured in to the amphitheater? So it will be figured into the design. So you can see this stage is kind of a little bit lower than what this is. So it'll be sort of that natural kind of amphitheater uh, shape. So you'll have some, uh, you'll have some of that figured in, although it still is going to function ADA wise and whatnot. So there'll be pieces of it, although it won't be, uh, it won't be a, a, a big, you know, dome type of experience. It'll be more of a multifunctional type of amphitheater. We got constant feedback on the amphitheater. Um, one of the things was people wanted to be able to watch music or something and see the 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 um, the bay from behind it, right? Some people weren't interested in having a year round. They were concerned about the maintenance and costs and safety of having a year round full dome. Um, so this was the city and the consultants taking in everything and trying to figure out the best of the possible options given feedback. All right, so that's 2.2 million for that whole area and the, the electrical and all those components incorporated in that area. Okay, we're moving on to the next thing. One of the biggest things people wanted was a civic scale plaza for 4th of July, first Fridays, food trucks and community events. And so with that, lots of discussions about where it was. In the old plan, it was in the middle of, of the park, but continually talking with the community. One of the things that they loved most about Beachfront Park was that it was right on the water. That's one of the things that makes our park so beautiful. Um, so if we're going to have um, civic events and bring the community together, uh, the, the push was let's do it closer to the water. So right here at the end of Stamps Way and, and, and how, down at the bottom where we have that access to the beach um, was where Waterfront Plaza was decided would be a great place to have it. And that includes a uh, stamping of, of the concrete, lighting and vendor hookups to encourage larger community events and actually a uh, seating there for people to come and sit. And these are just pictures of other waterfront plazas that when people started looking at that and thinking about that and the opportunities that could come about in our community from encouraging encouraging ourselves to hang out down there. And in our focus groups, everyone, uh, when we people were saying, what are your favorite things to do at uh, Beachfront Park? 
Sunny, how many people said eat their lunch down there and they wish there were food trucks there? Yes, food trucks was a big thing. So yes, a lot of people eat their lunch. I eat my lunch down there sometimes. So the hope is, is as this develops and is built and we have increasing businesses, uh, you know, this might be an opportunity for some, some uh, local entrepreneurs to be able to set up food trucks there and be able to provide food to our community and, and increase people's ability to have a wonderful and relaxing lunch as well, as well as the larger events that we hope to have. All right, so I'm not seeing anything. So I'm just gonna keep moseying on because we've got a lot. Um, the next thing to touch on was increased play area. That was a huge um, concern is that more uh, different aged opportunities um, for youth to play. And there's a hollowed log and there's some rock climbing here. So um, one of the other things that was identified is that uh, Kidstown is a huge, um, memory and a huge moment in our community's history of coming together. But um, ADA accessibility and some other components of it, we've aged out of those and we need to incorporate them back. So three different play areas are proposed in the park. And these can be phased and, and these are have different, different key elements. One is a new soft turf ADA accessible adventure play area that's right over here, 1.2 million. I actually had a, a mother of an, an, an autistic child uh, send me links and ideas because she cares about not only her child, but other children. And that came up several times, um, making sure that we have thoughtful play amenities that are accessible. Um, and then expand Kids Town and update it. So the new ADA surf is 1.2 million. Uh, the expand Kid Town and do some updates around it is 900,000. And this bouldering area is 700,000. Those are, are the costs for um, increasing those areas. And then moving on to the botanical garden with native plants and, and Talwa culture. Oh, sorry okay. to interrupt, Tali. Someone had wondered, actually a couple of people have wondered on Facebook, will there be any sensory park equipment specifically in those playgrounds? Yeah, so that in this, for example, this uh, it, uh, creative playgrounds that welcome everyone over here, there's some sensory items that can be incorporated. And if you look at this, this one is a great example because it goes with the nature theme of our park um, and is soothing. But over here on the left hand side, there's a circle of sensory toys. Also, one of the things that uh, the playground um, companies that I've been looking into and talking with, a lot of them like the outdoor um, type of uh, logs and rocks. That's why you'll see this bouldering activity and creating some kind of nook elements where kids can sit and just have this uh, rock thing, how it's enclosed a little bit, just so they can get back there and have a little protection from the noise for a minute to take a break. So some of these design areas for that ADA accessible play area will incorporate a lot of those components in that. All right. The other question we had, Holly, was in regard to uh, bus and transportation, and if that was incorporated or not, and, and that actually has come up in some of our discussions. And so, having the streets be wide enough, or actually you can kind of see it right in front of the, the pool there, being wide enough to stop, have the bus be able to park, let people out. There's a spot by the waterfront plaza as well, uh, and by the amphitheater. Area. So, you'd be able to pull right over, right along Stamps Way. We'd have designated area for those bus uh, stops because eventually, you know, this if this does become uh, that mecca and kind of that hub, we are going to have tourist buses come to this community and they're going to need to pull in and this will be a great spot for them to, to come, let somebody off and really have them explore what is our area and this park will hopefully have the essence of exactly what Crescent City and, and our community is. And 
with that, I think that's a great opportunity to go to another mentee poll real quick, kind of related to some ideas about when you're developing a park. So if we want to pop over to that real quick, uh, if you want to check, I changed the polling opportunity right now. So when you're thinking about developing beachfront park, how would you prioritize 100 points? Would it be those large amenities like um, an amphitheater? Or would it be small nature focused places like the picnic area where you're just enjoying that? It could even be the, uh, the area which is the crescent shape, which is it's not a huge amenity, but it's small places to focus and be quiet. Um, then there's also the opportunity of multiple small amenities, incorporating small components from each of these areas to create a bigger, a bigger uh, uh, experience. And then there's really focusing on community centered areas, um, if that's your priority. So if you had 100 points, how would you prioritize this? So kind of a neat little function of Minty where you can kind of prioritize and almost spend your, your budget, so to speak, and what would you spend it on? Kind of a cool deal. So Holly, what I might do is I might share my screen. So we'll, we'll We'll give people a chance, especially people on Facebook, because we're about a 20 minute uh, or 20 second lag to uh, to that. Give them a chance. The consultant actually sent me today some pretty cool perspectives of some of the different areas. So now that you've touched on them, so this is a different perspective view of that waterfront plaza. So this is Stamps Way coming down. This is how you turn. This is the the staircase that's already built, uh, and then you have the the different seating areas. I'll get some of the other ones that, that they sent. Uh, this is the amphitheater from kind of a different view. So again, Stamps Way, looking towards the amphitheater, sitting down. This is that decomposed granite area. Uh, you have uh, you have another uh, very similar view, apparently. Amphitheater from a slightly different angle. This one's more uh, in the uh, in the park itself. You can see again, there's that decomposed granite area. This is looking back towards Stamps Way, so you can see how drive is up here. This is how the amphitheater will kind of sit. You can kind of see how it's down uh, in that uh, in that fashion on that shot. Uh, this is another shot of that waterfront plaza. So these are the benches that uh, that uh, Holly was mentioning, where you could sit and enjoy your lunch. These are also areas where food trucks could come and park. So you have that component of it there. This is ADA uh, pathways going down the park. So you can actually get to those different areas and have them be accessible uh, really for all. There's another shot of that lookout hill. Again, showing some trees. So it's a good point. You know, we'll need to make sure that these trees are removed or at least allow that viewing corridor that we're trying to have people experience uh, coming off of, uh, off of that. Another shot of that sort of that lookout hill where you'll be able to look over our entire community a shot of just uh, what it might feel like along Stamps Way uh, as the, the different trees and whatnot are, uh, are fully mature at that point. And then this could be you know, anywhere in the park, right? There's a yoga class going on uh, or something like that. So anyway, just some perspective views of, uh, of what this new park could look and feel like. Miss Went, uh, you can maybe pull up the uh, the poll and we can see, uh, see how the, the people are uh, feeling about those different things. Interesting community centered area. So that's your waterfront plaza area and then your large amenities, which would be, you know, your amphitheater type uh, type components uh, have a little bit more of a, of a weight. And Sunny Valero wins the in-house poll with community centered areas taking the lead. <laughs> yep, I, I, that's, that's my personal um, interest. Um, we did have someone ask that we kind of skipped over the Tsunami Memorial Fountain. Is there any plans to move that to Beachfront Park? So, so Would that be in the small amenities? But it's not in the park master plan as it sits right now, but you know, this is a big park. So if, if the community, if the council wanted to say, hey, we want this amenity somewhere in here, but we're still at the point we could incorporate it. Uh, Tsunami Memorial Fountain is being discussed at the council level right now. And so, you know, I definitely encourage uh, uh, all people to, to tune in and well, I'm sure we'll get it out on Facebook when it actually comes. But we'll look, be looking at that component of it as well as revamping it where it currently sits in that Memorial Fountain Plaza there right behind the library. All right. 
And we'll show you, uh, we're almost done. We have just a handful of slides. Um, we're getting through this. You guys are amazing and patient. This is a lot that creates this big part that we're talking about. So uh, right now we're looking at over by the visitor center, the cultural center. Um, when talking with the community about uh, incorporating the history of the Tawa people and incorporating opportunities for not only our local community to learn about it, but also visitors to the area. I'll tell you one thing, um, the PGA design was just moved by the conversation with the cultural committee from Talwa Dani Nation and Elk Valley Rancheria and learning about their history um, that they they just thought like anyone coming to visit would want to learn about some of these wonderful um, designs, um, the architecture and, and the history. So this is the area that was kind of discussed to put that and this red is stamping uh, the cultural committee gave design stamps and ideas for designs that are part of the basket weaving and have have different meaning that could be stamped in the pathways going around here and you'll see number 31 is a slab house, a traditional house, and possibly even a dance platform. Uh, the wonderful thing about this location is it's right next to the pool. And what does every fourth grader in Delmark County get to do? Swim lessons. Swim lessons. And when I was with the uh, Crescent Oak kids today, I said, hey, you guys, how do you get to go to swim lessons? And they and they all said, oh my gosh, swim. Because I was trying to remind them of where, you know, make sure everyone knew where I was talking about, about Beachfront Park. And then we got to the conversation at the very beginning where I was talking about the history of the Talua people. And the kids didn't know that the people that are from here, the indigenous people, the native people were Talua people. Um, and yesterday that was quite sad because um, there was actually one young woman who was native in here. And when I started talking about this, she's Talawa, she, her eyes brightened up. And then when the kids realized that they could go to fourth grade swimming lessons and then come over here and walk around this path and see what the houses look like and learn about the culture, that they could have that experience. I mean, this would be wonderful right across from the, the uh, outdoor adventure play area. Uh, we can incorporate learning um, and this botanical garden with native of plants uh, that those would be plants that are native here and would also be plants and described how are they used with the indigenous people in their culture, whether the medicine medicinal or they were just there if they thought they were kind of a weed. We all have weeds right things that we don't like um, or if they were integral into their uh, lifestyle. And their culture. So that's what this area over here is looking at. You'll notice that Right now, there's pool parking right here. So um, when we say this price, that is removing this 950,000 isn't just for this, but it's removing that parking area, creating the pathway, the uh, new entrance to the existing parking and um, doing grass and irrigation and all those things to make this area um, beautiful and lush and an opportunity to showcase some of the best, best things about our area. And it's also hidden between the buildings. So we would have a better chance of capturing more of the, the plants and native plants that grow in this area rather than right along the beach. So that protected space is a great opportunity for that kind of uh, native botanical garden. All right, so moving on from there, this is following out that whole area. You'll see how that red stamping for the history of the place kind of swirls and stamps around here. And this is a, a neat area. You'll see the increase at the new uh, entrance to the existing parking for the pool. You'll also see 36 right in front of the pool is the bus drop off space. We really wanted to make sure it's easy for those buses to get in, drop those kids off. I mean, how many kids go down for school um, um, uh, field trips to kids town, right? We need to keep that going. We need those kids to have opportunities to play and have fun. So that's that parking for those buses right there and those access 
And as you come down, there's right here, you're going to see bank stabilization along Elk Creek. That's $600,000, and that needs to be done to protect that area at some point. And so that was something we put into this cost estimate just to, to put it there and make note of that need. Uh, that was done along the front of Beachfront Park. Isn't that correct, Mr. Weir? Was that done in 2013? Yeah, it was. Yeah, I think the actual construction was 2013. It was uh, a FEMA project, actually, because of the 2011 uh, tsunami and some of the just the, the currents and the forces that that revetment actually faced. And so we redid that portion of it, but it really needs to be done around the, uh, the other piece as well, just because of deterioration over time. So we wanted to include that in here to make sure we're, we're making note of that need, right? We just don't, we don't want to um, just look at what's going to make it bright and shiny, but what's going to make the park sustainable for the long term, right? So, and then coming down is the labyrinth, a wonderful design by uh, our local labyrinth community. It's a tree, it's a beautiful design with pieces of, uh, um, pieces of the area built into the labyrinth, which would make it special and unique. Uh, that cost for leveling the ground and doing all the work around that area is 300,000. And then at the bottom, you're gonna see the Komome Japanese Memorial Boat. Uh, that was, uh, this whole area is to tell the story uh, about our community and the Komome Japanese Boat helps tell the story about the tsunamis and our relationship with the sister city, but it has a nice upbeat spin on it. It's about that relationship between those high schoolers who found that boat on the beach a year after the tragic event over in Rakuz and Takara and how they cleaned it up and took it back to Japan. And this relationship between our high school students and their high school students that goes on year after year. And it's just about hope, even after devastation like a tsunami that you grow and, and our young people are so resilient. So that was brought up. That would be a wonderful uh, a opportunity to put that there, as well as moving all the memorials located throughout the park over in this area along this walking path that's stamped with the Talawa design. This is really a place that's that quiet space in that park. This is that moment of reflection, of watching the birds in Elk Creek and really just having that serenity. We didn't want to just provide amenities. We wanted to provide quiet spaces as well. Um, and then this whole Elk Creek nature area with Talwa Design and Pass, the reason that's $315,000 is because that's for irrigation and plantings of sust uh, sustainable trees. And that's making sure that's done in a thoughtful way and that it's all ADA compliant as well. So with that, we is do have. Oh, sorry, Holly, we do have a question um, that I, I was going to let Eric on the chat, but it's unmentioned there a bridge between the beachfront park and the RV park or south of the pool to the RV park. Is that still an option? That did not make it into the master plan. Yeah, that one didn't. Uh, that was the, the bridge. That was an idea that was uh, vetted out there. Um, we were picking between the bridge across or the ADA access down to the beach. Um, and just because of Elk Creek being such a critical place for uh, wildlife, um, we kind of thought that ADA access going the opposite way would be, a, would be better for that. Mr. Weir, do you have any comments on that? No, just it, it was in past plans and still could be talked about. The ADA access down to that to that part wasn't real conducive the way Elk Creek comes in and wildlife and whatnot. I think what uh, what Kevin's referring to is actually a bridge that goes across Elk Creek itself mm -hmm. to the RV park side of things. Um, so that could be something that's thought about, you know, in the future. Would we would have to work hand in hand with Fish and Game and Coastal and, and all of that. But the idea would be almost like a summer sort of bridge, kind of like what you have on the Smith River, I think, just to allow access to the other side uh, of the crescent there. All right. And um, anything else, Sunny? Um, please add the parking on Front Street as shown on the plan as an element of the total project. So the second half to Front Street, I believe that was right for the parking, the slanted parking. Um, I think that is on the plan, correct? 
It is. Yeah. So there's a, there's that piece that we have identified for the, the piece of front street that's already built uh, to be able to add that parking. That's I think 1.1 million if I remember off the top of my head, something like that. Uh, the piece that's, that's shown on the plan, but really it, it would be hard to make it function as it is, or at least it would be a lot more uh, expensive is that piece by the cultural center. Uh, we can certainly put it as an option, but it's going to be a lot more because that other part of Front Street isn't built. So it's not just adding the south piece of it, right? You have to build the median portions of the street and whatnot. And part of the grant is we can't, uh, we would only be able to the parking that is um, touching the park. We couldn't do Front Street or anything beyond that. It would just have to be that south facing parking that's connected to the actual park. There are some parameters about what you can spend the Prop 68 funding on. So that there's that. Um, and with that real quick, we're almost done, but I do have another Menti poll. If you guys don't mind popping over to that real quick. This is the one of the most important ones, I think. Um, this is one that I really am excited to hear from you guys about. And this is about if you are picking priority projects, what are the things that are most important to you? What are the things that you prioritize? Is it that, an, that a feature has a variety of uses, that the cost of maintenance is low, that it has education or cultural and historical events tied to it, that it increases the health and wellness of the community, that it has an opportunity to increase recreational tourism in our area, that it's ADA accessible for all areas or that it's a community gathering place. Because here's the thing, in talking with the community, everyone has different ideas about what recreation is and what's important to our community. So if you guys don't mind taking a second and, and doing this poll for me real quick, I this one will be helpful for me, not only in planning the park and your priority projects, but also thinking about the events and things we need to do in the park and where your guys' priorities lie. So I'm excited to hear about this for the park, but also for selfish, selfish purposes as the recreation director. Someone did mention too, we didn't forget your comments. Um, there is exercise equipment throughout the park. That is part of the plan is to have different stations, I believe throughout the park um, that people can stretch and strengthen through. Um, and also someone was wondering about a start and completion date that we're looking at for the park. So the grant application is due March 12th. We should know if we uh, were given the grant by November or December, and then there's the project rollout. The project has to be completed and be usable by the community by 2025, June of 2025. So Mr. Weir, do you wanna talk about rolling out large projects like this? So obviously there's, there are multiple components of it, like we talked about earlier. So this is a great concept design, gives us enough information to come up with a concept level estimate, right? Do the planning that we're talking about here where we can prioritize these, uh, these different components. If we get funded in say November, uh, there's a process of, you know, signing agreements and whatnot, but it's probably gonna take that first year to actually get whatever the amenity is designed. So we're funded in November of 2021 Right, 2022 is going to be all about design. Ideally, we put it out to bid probably right around November ish, kind of in the winter time. We get typically the best construction prices and we bid it in the winter where contractors don't have their full summer schedule already, already booked out. And so then the hope would be as soon as rains, uh, rains break uh, in 2023, we would be under construction. Projects like this, uh, well, I mean, you saw Front Street. Front Street got built in basically a year. So uh, depending on the, the different components of it, they would, I'm sure, tackle one component, try to get that done. And then it might take them the second year on an eight and a half million dollar project to, uh, to build some of those other components. But that's kind of your time frame. So under construction 2023, hopefully completed by, uh, by the end of 2024. Great question. Yeah, that was a wonderful question. So uh, just right off the top here, we have community gathering place is number one. Opportunity to increase recreational tourism is number two. Oh, that's amazing. And number three is education of cultural and historical events. That's exciting as well. 
So uh, we only have one more thing to share with you guys as far as the park. And then uh, we're closing out this meeting and getting to the end of it. And I'm excited to uh, get on to the next part. Oops. There we go. Oops. Uh, hold on. Sorry, people. I don't so know what happened. The, you know, the, the last thing on that list was, was maintenance costs. Right? But that is going to be a key component of this from the from the city side of things and definitely the city council is going to need to take uh, into consideration as we build this. The last thing we want to do is build something that that's great and looks great for the first couple months and then we don't have the resources to maintain it. So uh, we will need to be cognizant of that. And as we bring this back to the council level, we'll be uh, we will be recommending options for additional resources to make sure that that we do keep these amenities uh, looking as good as what they should look. And that's also one of the uh, one of the components of the grant too is that you can uh, show that you you can maintain it and that you're making reasonable requests with these grant funds. Um, one of the on one of the calls was that a lot of projects that incorporate water components like pools and splash pads aren't necessarily approved as readily because the overhead and cost and maintenance far exceeds because none of these these grant fundings cover costs and maintenance. So that is something to also take into consideration when we're submitting this application. We're going for a lot of money and we're going for a lot of amenities. We need ones that have are reasonable with with that in mind. Um, and can you guys see my screen? What do you guys see? Not me. Okay, uh, not my screen. Okay. I'm doing pretty good. Not too many errors this time. All right. So the last thing to share with you is the beach front park gateway that would come across right here at Stamps Way and Front Street. And here we have a design where you can see into the park and looking at down Stamps Way, that is still open. So when you're driving down, you can see all the way to the beach, but we also have some gateway components. We have that redwood wood with that rock and that wonderful redwood tree on there and a nice sign that says Beachfront Park welcoming people into our park. Right now we don't have a welcoming entrance. We don't have any signage and that's a really important thing I think moving forward with the park. Personally, um, I would love to be able to send people right to a main entrance where they look down and right into the beautiful beach and, and down the center of the park. So that beachfront park gateway is 140,000 uh, for that component. And so from there, we've touched on all of the key components of the park. And right here, I just want you to see, this is the park right now. This is my version of mocking it up. The dog park's already there. We're super lucky with that. And just thinking about as we move into the next phases, so you're adding one thing at a time and you're thinking about how it all lays out and think about the phasing of this project and what are the key components that you're interested in having there. These are just a couple of ones that I, I put into that um, just to give you an, an idea of, of looking over it. Uh, I want to now uh, just encourage you guys to think about everything that we've we've said to you and then now's your chance to play with the numbers. Uh, what we've done is we've created a Google survey that you can click, on, click onto. It's at the crescentcity.org page and Sunny will also put it in the Facebook page uh, in the Facebook event. Uh, you can also go to this the link here um, and go to it there. And from there, you can, there's um, a survey, a picture of the park, the master plan, and each area is numbered. And within that survey, you'll be able to click on the components that you think are most important. But here's what I learned working with the sixth graders at Crescent Elk today. Get your calculators get your pencils and get a scratch piece of paper because adding these things up to reach your 8.5 million for the Prop 68 grant is gonna take a little bit of thinking. And if you're doing it with your family, um, try not to argue over what everyone wants, but really think about what the community would need and what you would like. That's the first section of it. The second section is there's another, yeah. 
Only one I share my screen real quick and we can kind of walk through it with them real okay. quick just so they see. And then also uh, Ron Cole had a quick question in regard to the curvy boardwalk sidewalks that were put in all oh, back in 2012 or so. That's one of those scalable pieces. So if you look at the mass plan, how it's drawn, they have a widening of those streets and new sidewalks. One of those pieces that, that we have a fully functional park right now with curvy sidewalks in them, they function. That's one of those components that, that is a piece that we don't have to prioritize right away. So the curvy sidewalks could stay, they're very functional. And that's kind of how the, uh, the park master plan is estimated right now. So uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna share my screen real quick and we'll just walk you to how to get to the survey. So city website, right? The easiest way that I've found to get to it is you just click on the meeting we we're just in, all right? Here's all the links that we've already done. Survey link, click on that. Brings you to your survey that Holly's talking about. Okay, great. Yes, this is where we wanna go, right? How would you build or what would you build for 8.5 million? Okay, that's that next piece. Okay, shot of the park. And then the, the different components. So, and this is what you were talking about, Holly, right? Where yeah. these are all the different components that we've gone through tonight, right? The dog park and the bike park component, looking down at the, you know, the lookout hill all the way down, right? 30, 31 different pieces on here. Uh, and what you need to do is try to mix and match because right, this is what the city staff's going to be doing. This is what the council is going to be faced with. Build your park for eight and a half million, right? So, so I want to build the uh, whatever it happens to be. I want all the pieces of the bike park. So now I've just spent almost five million dollars. So now I have three million left, right? And like Holly said, great exercise for the family. Put your kids out there, you know, and find those components and that add up to your eight and a half million dollars. Once you do that, um, answer what you're most excited about. Right. That's just me being cheesy Holly, like wanting to know what you're excited about. <laughs> <laughs> and then so after they're done with this, then Holly, so then they click next. Right? And keep in mind now you're going to have a, uh, a survey that's not real accurate. But... I'll delete yours, Mr. Rear. <laughs> Excellent. All right. So now I click next. Now what? Now, this is another grant opportunity from Prop 68 as well. We've been talking with um, the team that's running this and we can apply for an additional 3 million. It's called uh, Rural Recreation and Tourism. And if there are elements that you want to develop in your park programs that will increase recreation, cultural awareness and tourism to your area, you can apply for an additional 3 million. And so this is where 8.5 million is a lot of money, but that's a lot of park we're playing with right there. There's 35 acres. So this is another opportunity for you to think about that next round. This next application is due November. Um, so you can go ahead and think ahead now, um, pick what you want for your first round, and then if you could dream a little bit more for our community, um, go ahead and think what those additional, th that additional, how you'd spend that additional $3 million. But make sure we have to, you know, think about it. We have to say under that $3 million mark. So really uh, those zeros, I'll tell you, I've done this. And sometimes when my zeros get off, it throws the whole thing. So be careful when you're tallying those zeros. And then also you guys, just so you know, if you're done looking at this and you already know what, how to do that, I put up another uh, poll in Minty that you can hit. And if you guys have any questions about this survey, go ahead and let us know. Here's another thing I'm just asking, uh, if you've uh, been part of this uh, outreach already, where, where did you participate and um, what did you, how did you participate in this? And if you have any feedback about that the city is really looking to communicate with the community a lot and how best to get your guys's input on on these opportunities that we're going to be looking into for our, our city okay so i will quit sharing my screen sounds like you had a minty one going too holly yep i have one going right now um let's see uh oh all right so just real quick on Facebook, um, David 
Garcia writes, great job on the presentation and planning Crescent City's future is super bright because of this project. So thank you, David, for your support and enthusiasm. Facebook's been great with great questions. You guys have been um, fantastic. So I posted the link for you guys there um, for the after um, presentation survey, and then I will get it up to the event here in just a bit. So this was one you can hit, but you don't, it's after this discussion and looking at the costs associated with each item area, what are your favorite features? What are the things uh, that you're, you're excited about in the park uh, that we've talked about? Um, any of the things that you saw that you didn't think that you'd be excited about and then looking at the costs associated that you're just still super pumped about. Um, just go ahead and toss those ideas up there for us. And, and then I just wanna say thank you again to everyone that participated in this year and a half process. Thank you for all your commitment to these meetings. I mean, we've had hour long meetings. This is a two, an hour and a half, two hour long meeting. I mean, this just shows the determination of the community come together. So. Thank you so much for all of your hard work helping us. Yeah, ab absolutely. Just reiterate that um, it's an exciting time, and this is a this is an opportunity that doesn't just doesn't come around. Right, this is first time we've ever had a shot like this. Eight and a half million dollars. We've uh, the community's engaged. We're we're pretty excited about our chances on this one. Now, you never know, it's very competitive. Almost every city is going to put an application, but because of all the input, because of all the community engagement, you know, with our tribal partners as well, this is an exciting project for us. And uh, let's keep our fingers crossed. Yeah, this has been ongoing for a while. So, you know, the community support, you guys have been fantastic. So thank you everyone for coming out and all the meetings. Um, we really reached out to different community. We put ourselves as staff out of our comfort zones, going to um, and focus groups and doing things different than we normally would as a city. So we're really excited to continue doing that for the future. So um, thank you guys for being kind to us when we've been on those groups and <laughs> all those one-on-one -on -one conversations and interviews that we've done. So we really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. And then as it, as it progresses, definitely, you know, stay tuned. We'll keep the community informed as to, you know, the, exactly what happens. Right? We don't get funded, right? You'll know about that as well. And the thing is we're going to keep trying, right? I mean, portions of this park were built without a huge grant opportunity like this. And this community can come together. We can find ways. And so uh, we will keep, uh, keep working and keep everybody engaged. And then the last closing thing, we're already looking at other things that are available. Sunny just sent us something about uh, additional grants available for soccer fields coming available. There's also, we've also been tipped off by other partners and, and um, other, uh, our consultants working with, because of the way we did this community outreach, we may be able to tap in different uh, funds for cultural events and cultural funds, as well as um, arts. And so we're gonna keep plugging away at this. Um, so keep up the work and with that we're going to close but I am going to end us with one last minty um, just because uh, I, I am a kind of a I this is something that I think is important to know from you guys because I get excited about it as well. Now after all of this, how excited are you for this and we'll just leave this minty going as we say goodbye to everybody. Um, I'm, I'm so excited. The city, everyone I talked to is so excited, but some of you may not be, you may have thought it was boring. That's okay to say too. Um, but we're, we're, we're excited about this. Some people may be nervous. Just tell us how you feel and we'll leave that there. And with that, anybody else have a wonderful, wonderful night. And I can't wait to see your surveys. Please let people know that they can find the survey and the information and the plans and the videos tomorrow about this and they have until Friday to get it to us. So thank you everyone. The other thing while we have uh, some people on Facebook, just give one more shameless plug. Measure S Oversight Committee is also, applications are available. So Measure S is another big thing for our community, right? $1.3 million will be coming uh, to the city to support fire, police, the pool, streets, uh, there's going to be a lot of important work on that. So if, you're, if you live in the city of limits and you're interested, please apply. Uh, those, will, those will be part of our next community meeting. So February 25th, we're going to have a community meeting. It's going to be all about the police and 
uh, their department, their staffing needs, all of those uh, components to, to move them in the right direction in the future. Um, beginning of March, we're gonna have a meeting all about the streets. Front Street will be part of that meeting. There will be a discussion on how do we get the rest of Front Street done, as well as what streets do we wanna see as priorities as a community to use that money and get that going. Uh, the pool is gonna be coming up on this next council meeting. COVID numbers are starting to drop. We're going to, uh, to be looking at uh, how do we get this pool back going and what is the timing on that? So Ms. Wint will have another fabulous presentation to the, uh, to the council here on February 16th, which is our next meeting. We'll be talking about the, uh, the pool as well. So anyway, lots of, lots of good stuff to, uh, to come. Just had a question. Any participation allowed for measure S committee from county residents? So participation, yes, right? We're going to have these meetings. There'll be, uh, the public will be invited. Uh, we'll take public comment. However, to be actually on the Measure S Oversight Committee, you need to be a city resident. So that's a, that's a part of the requirements. But as always, this community, this city serves much more than just the city limits. And so, uh, so be, uh, be a participant, have your voice heard public comment wise. Uh, the council uh, is always uh, receptive to that. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Um, a lot of feedback saying we've got a great city team. And like Mr. Weir said, if you're in the city, be part of the team. Uh, you can be part of Measure S. And if you want to be a volunteer and help and hang out with this crazy team, let us know. We'll be doing some projects and fun stuff. And this actually is a great team to be part of. And it's a great community to serve. So with that, have a wonderful night, everyone. And thank you for joining us. Thank you, guys.